Hey everybody, it's Mo Bunnell, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. I'm the author of The Snowball System and I and my teams have trained over 15,000 experts all over the world on sound, efficient, and authentic business development techniques. I'm joined today by Marissa King. The last episode we, that I talked to Marissa as well, she's the author of Social Chemistry. She's a deep expert, PhD at Yale, deep expert in networks, social networks, how relationships are formed, and her content just 100% aligns with everything that we teach in the Snowball System and, and in uh, our Grow Big trainings, which we've delivered all over the world. I had a ball in the last episode listening to Marissa's answer to the question, how can we use all the content and social chemistry to grow our book of business, grow our relationships, and grow our career? And she outlined the top three ways that networks are formed and you can assess what yours is, really cool stuff. In this episode, we're gonna double click on how do we create and close more opportunities? How do we grow that book of business? So Marissa's gonna comment on that exact question in a moment. And what's neat, by the way, is she gave some content that's not in the book, that she's that's the new stuff she's really thinking about now, and it was really, really good. So that's gonna be in a second. Right now, quick, uh, professional commercial, uh, if you if you want our best research or our best thinking into how rainmakers think, if you want to know how we think about how rainmakers think, because we've trained over 15,000 folks, then head over to growbigplaybook.com. You'll get an instant download. You can read it in about eight minutes, and it's got the eight beliefs that rainmakers have in their head that are growth-oriented and creating a positive difference in the world. So go check that out at growbigplaybook.com. All right, here's Marissa answering the question, how do we create and close more business using our social networks? Hey everybody, it's Mo, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. You already know I'm talking with Marissa King. If you didn't catch the last episode where she digs into social chemistry, her amazing book, I really loved it, and she gave us the three network signature types to figure out what type of network that you've got. In this episode, so if you haven't read, if you haven't listened to that or seen it, go back. It's great. And it's a great precursor and pre-work sort of, if you will, to this one. In this episode, I'm not sure where this is going to go, Marissa, but I, I just have an inkling that you're going to have something interesting to say. Um, how can how can our high-end experts, people with one foot in the delivery of complex service, one, one foot into business development, what do you think they can do? to create more opportunities, to close more business, to, to grow their books of business in a way that, that feels authentic and is leveraging this idea of a powerful network. One of the things that's really powerful about networks is we can apply them to our own selves and think about our own networks, but we can also use them to think about network uh, our relationships in general. So we can think about that with our relationships with our customers, uh, at the relationships that we have with people in our company. And so as you start to think about your own work and what you're trying to achieve. One of the things is we think about growing your book of business that I think is helpful to think about is trying to match this way of network thinking to the type of whatever you're trying to sell or whatever the good that ends or service that you're providing. So if we walk through these types, it also helps illuminate what are some of the drawbacks to different network types and how do you need to be really careful about addressing them. So we can start with conveners again. One of the things that we know from a broad body of research is that if you are working with a product in which, or a service in which the quality is ambiguous, so it's really difficult to ascertain what the true underlying value of that product is, that a convening network is going to be really important because in those convening type networks, there's trust and reputational benefits. So understanding, wait, one of the best things you can do if you have a product in which there's an ambiguous quality is to be embedded in a convening like network in which your customers can vouch for you, other people in your network can vouch for you. And so there's a lot of trust and reciprocity and people are getting repeated exposure to the same information, which increases their ability to believe in what you're doing. I mean, that is really, really critical. And that is in contrast, right? If we think about a different type of way that business deals are often structured, like program deals. So imagine that you are, um, in real estate transactions, or you're a headhunter, or your business really depends on putting either keeping people apart or putting them together. So you're straddling two different parties. 
One of the things that we can learn from brokers in this regard is they're often actually at risk for a reputation, what is called in literature, reputational assassination, or they're greeted with suspicion because they're keeping people apart. And to overcome that, one of the biggest things that we know from the research is that the broker themselves has to be perceived as being empathetic. And that ability to be perceived as empathetic overcomes this tendency of people just be like, I'm not sure, like, are they with us? Are they not with us? And also a key question every broker faces is when to keep people apart and when to bring them together. And so thinking very carefully about the trade-offs between that is really key for anyone who's in a brokering type business. And the final is the thing that we can think about are expansionists, right? So this is if you have a product that either the value is really clear, it's very inexpensive or not costly to experiment so people can easily adopt it. You just need to get it in their hands. Then you can really learn from expansionists. And one of the key things there is thinking about, all right, how do I manage my network, right? How can I, that you truly lead a large network and there are great examples about how to think about doing this effectively. And the key piece is actually understanding how to do this in a timely manner. So we know actually the, how frequently you need to be uh, kind of touching people in terms of it, and being able to keep that network large and growing, but effective in uh, making sure that it's manageable. This is amazing. And I'm thinking of clients, you know, when I think about broker networks, we've trained the high-end art uh, auctioneers at Sotheby's worldwide. And, you know, they've got a broker network. We think of um, uh, commercial insurance brokers, healthcare brokers. They have the same idea. So I'm thinking of the different clients we've got in each one. I think of lawyers, very ambiguous product, you know, what or service, you know, so that convening network could really make sense. Is there Are these kind of examples resonating? You, you nailed it. And I, it's, uh, your, your examples are, like, I think that's helpful is to start to think about where, where do you fit in these? And the examples you gave are very clear. And there's actually lots of research in each of these categories, right? So we can think about also um, venture capital, like within this, you did the typology very well with the examples you gave um, based on what we know from research. Yeah. So let's go deeper then. Awesome. And um, I'm, I'm with empathy. I'm thinking of our clients. You know, so let's say that somebody sort of started to optimize their network in the ways that you just shared. You know, they're they're really dialing up trust. They're getting really focused on when they should bring people together and when not, if they're a broker, things like that. Um, so let's say there's opportunities in the pipeline. And let's say that, um, uh, for an example, a lawyer really, really needs to or really, would really like to bring in a certain matter to their firm or a broker would really be uh, excited. Their health and group broker at Willis Towers Watson, they'd really like to, 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 to bring in, to become broker of record with a client. What do people do with their networks to try to actually get the deals done? Is there any advice you have there? Oh, that's a great question. Like, I, I mean, once you... I, I, when we've been talking a lot about network structure, right? So think about how you can bring deals in or how you can effectively translate um, and make that move towards closing a deal. But at the end of the day, the ability to do that in the end, it really boils down to trust. And if we think about be moving beyond just the structure type of networks, there's also a key part of this is actually the quality of the interactions that you have. And at the end of the day, ultimately everything boils down to trust. And that really arises for all three of these types in momentary interaction. So how can you create high quality interactions that create enough trust that things are likely to move forward? I love that. You know, I'm thinking of really practical things like um, if you're a convener, you might be able to connect a, a, a client that's thinking about hiring you with somebody that already does in a way that's helpful for both, but basically creates a, how do you know, Jane? Well, she <laughs> saved the day three years ago when we had this contract go south. And, you know, it, so doing things like that, I feel like you, utilize, building the network's one thing and then being able to access your network in a way that's mutually beneficial for everybody. People want to help you, you know? Yes. And that's what I get. I got so excited because that's when I get really excited about networks, right? The power of networks is when you put together individuals and groups, you can get outsized gains. And so by investing in your network and creating value for your network, that comes back multifold to you. And so everything you described is exactly true. And thinking about it from that perspective is so incredibly helpful. Um, and I right. think that, that, right, not just for yourself, but everybody in your network and, and within your community. Yeah, well, you can see me jump in because I got to ask you one last thing for this episode and we'll, we'll wrap this one up. I'm really excited about your answer here because I feel like sometimes I'm 
I'm banging the, just the same drum over and over. So many of our audience, so many people are reluctant to ask for help. They're deeply ingrained service providers. They think all they should do is help the client. They get paid to help. They help. They go on to the next thing. And they don't understand. It. So if you get my hint here, I'm looking for some backup, Marissa. I'm looking for some backup. Give me some signs and steps here. Um, they don't understand that when you don't ask somebody for help, you're actually not giving them the opportunity to have that amazing feeling of helpfulness. And by the way, you're probably going to ask people that you've already saved the day for them 50 times. They want to help you. So give me some backup. Tell my people very directly why they should not hesitate to ask for help from their network. Yeah, I mean, you, this is really one of the most fundamental principles of how networks work, right? The norm of reciprocity. By asking for help, you're actually strengthening that relationship in a really powerful way. We also know from lots of research in psychology that people like people who ask for help more. Um, so it increases likability, it increases reciprocity. And as you said, right, you in many ways took the words right out of my mouth. Asking for help is really a gift to the other person, particularly in this moment. Asking for help allows the other person to have a sense of mastery. It gives them a sense that it reinforces their sense of purpose and allows them to get out of themselves. And right, particularly when people have been in so in social isolation for so long and so focused on themselves, we all want to get out of ourselves. Um, and asking for help allows the other person to do that. So by asking for help, you're actually not only helping yourself, but more importantly, you're helping the other person by allowing them to be of service. You, you can see me smiling from ear to ear. I'm gonna when this is done, and when we publish in a couple of months, I'm gonna send this to thousands of people because they need to hear this. This this even this ending point. All the other stuff's been awesome, but this ender stuff is so poignant for people because they they're um, they're limiting themselves by not asking for help over and over. Um, okay, Marissa, people are gonna want more of you. They're gonna want more of social chemistry. Where should they go? You can go to socialchemistry.com to learn about the book and my work. I love it. Thank you so much. And everybody, if you didn't catch the last episode with all the stuff that's foundation for this one, go back and watch or listen to that. And in the next episode, I know you think you, you probably know where I'm going. I'm going to ask Marissa how we can use our networks to deepen relationships. Thank you, Marissa. 